I'm Elizabeth Colbert. I'm the author of The Sixth Extinction, and I'm a staff writer at The New Yorker. I think that's a category almost we have to abandon. It doesn't matter if you're hopeful. It doesn't matter if you're not hopeful. It doesn't matter if you're an optimist or pessimist. Let's get on with it. We know that there are certain things that are better and choices that are worse. I was very interested in and concerned about what's become known as the amphibian crisis, which is this global die-off of amphibians. And it took scientists quite a while to figure out that it was being caused by a fungal disease. And I wanted to write about that because it seemed very ominous, but not that well known. I, I think that that remains the case today. Weirdly, my setting out on that story also coincided with this bat die-off that began very close to where I live. I live in Massachusetts. This began in upstate New York. It has since spread. It is now here in Michigan. So those two kind of very disturbing events, a bat die-off and an amphibian die-off, sort of got this going. If you look at the fossil record of the last half a billion years, there have been five so-called major mass extinctions. The worst of all of these is what's known as the end Permian extinction. That occurred about 250 million years ago, and that was caused by a very, very massive release of carbon dioxide. So the world heated up, just as it is right now, and the oceans acidified, their chemistry changed, they also lost oxygen. Uh, so it was a really devastating event for marine organisms. And also, by that point, there was a lot of life on land. It was a very devastating event on land, too. There are places in the world where the water is naturally acidified because of CO2 that is being vented from basically volcanic vents. A British scientist by the name of Jason Hall Spencer found one of these in the Gulf of Naples that was pouring almost pure carbon dioxide. And he did a really interesting and very significant sort of landmark study comparing what life was like away from these vents, volcanic vents, and right up close to it. And what he found is as you got right up close, a third of the species had dropped out. So if you consider that representative and you th imagine the oceans of the year 2100, it's entirely possible that a third of the species in the oceans will be gone. We have so re-engineered the whole Great Lakes system and what flows into the lakes and what flows out of the lakes, and they are very threatened by development along those shores and what we're dumping into the lakes and what we're moving around. Ship ballast is a huge vehicle for moving. The estimate is 10,000 species around the world every day. Many of them are, are microscopic. You are seeing more and more marine invaders, whether we're going to keep out some of the like Asian carp invasive species that are sort of moving through this very re-engineered water system, right? There shouldn't be a way for them you know, to move from the Mississippi into the Great Lakes, but there is. There are tremendous efforts, and in some cases, very successful efforts, to undo some of the damage that we've done. And the Great Lakes are a great example of this. A lot of people have put you know, a fantastic amount of time and effort to try to figure out how to improve the health of the Great Lakes. We still have a very, very long way to go. We need to really radically transform our energy systems, and we need to do it fast, not on a scale of centuries, but on a level of decades. The the thing that's so important to convey is that the system is operating on a big time delay. And the greenhouse gases that we're putting up into the atmosphere now, the full effects of those will not be felt for 20, 30 years, by which point there is no turning back. So people really need to realize that all of these warnings that are coming from scientists, they may sound kind of vaguely hysterical because I look out my window and I don't really see such dramatic changes. But the reason that those warnings are important to heed is because you can't take this back. They are trying to warn us 
about the future, which is already being determined today. So that is why we need to pay attention to what they're saying.